Hi, I'm Chris Hood, clinical instructor in cornea and external disease, cataract and refractive surgery at the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center. And today we'll be speaking about phacodynamics. The term phacodynamics was first coined by Dr. Barry Seibel more than 10 years ago, and he used the term to describe the physics of closed system phacoemulsification cataract surgery and how it translates into clinical performance. In other words, it's a safe and efficient removal of a cataract through a small incision with minimal disturbance to the eye. As a subset of phacodynamics is the term fluidics, which describes a balance of fluid inflow and outflow of fluid in the eye at the time of cataract surgery. So to first understand phacodynamics, we have to understand phacoemulsification. And this was a principle that was borrowed by Dr. Charles Kelman in the 1960s from dentistry. And the principle is to use longitudinally oscillating tip in the ultrasonic range to emulsify and remove the nuclear fragments from the eye through a small incision. And the frequency used today is between 28 and 45,000 hertz, or cycles per second. The reason we use that range is that less frequency is inefficient, and more frequency higher than that leads to potential wound burn and heat buildup. Now, the actual mechanism of phaco emulsification is not entirely clear, and there's two possible mechanisms by which it works. One is what we call the jackhammer effect, which is the effect of the direct mechanical impact of the needle that impacts and physically strikes the fragment that's trying to be removed. The other effect is called cavitation. In this effect, the needle is moving at such a high frequency that it actually pulls dissolved gases out of solution. And then the frequency moving in the opposite direction actually compresses and then causes implosion of those microbubbles, which then creates a wave of heat and pressure that radiate from the bevel of the phacoemulsification tip. And these two likely probably act in combination in phacoemulsification. Now I want to introduce a term here called followability. This is defined as a combination of the forces that attract the fragments to the tip of the phacoemulsification handpiece against the repulsive action of the ultrasound, because again, that needle is actually pushing things away physically. So in other words, it's how well things are brought to the tip of the ultrasound instrument and stay there. The term stroke length is another important term to understand, and it's basically the physical length that the needle moves within the phaco handpiece, and it's between two and four thousandths of uh, an inch. And actually, the power setting that we set on the FACO machine is a reflection of the stroke length. A higher stroke length is set as a higher power. Now, it goes without saying that the efficient FACO surgeon removes the nucleus using the minimal amount of required power and energy in the eye. And this is because of a couple reasons. One is that the heat buildup from the FACO can actually cause uh, wound burn, which can be devastating in its consequences. Secondly, the ultrasound energy has been shown to decrease the number of endothelial cells, which can lead to post-op corneal edema. And then lastly, there's the breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier, which has also been shown to be linked to the amount of energy used. So we can possibly decrease our post-op inflammation and possibly even the rate of cystoid macular edema by using lower energy to remove the nucleus. So the savvy phaco surgeon will actually alter the amplitude, duration, and delivery of the phaco energy in order to efficiently remove the cataract from the eye. But it requires a knowledge of phaco dynamics. So at this point, we have a question. In what form of power modulation for phaco emulsification does depression of the foot pedal in position three progressively increase the duty cycle? And you see your choices there. A, continuous phaco. B, phaco pulse. C, phaco burst. D, phaco dynamics. Or E, surge. So the answer is C, phaco burst. So let's first talk about different ways to modify the application of phaco energy. And the first of these is called continuous phaco, which is just what it sounds like. It's energy delivered continuously with no off period for the phaco energy. And in this setting, the surgeon sets the maximum preset power. And with the pressure of the foot pedal into position three, the stroke length increases up to that maximum preset power that's been set by the surgeon. So an example will help to clarify this. If we look at the bottom left graph, we can see that the power has been preset to a maximum of 100%. And with the depression of the foot pedal into position three, there's a linear rise in the power applied up to the preset maximum of 100%. On the right of the screen, we can see that the preset power has been set to a maximum of only 50%. And even with complete depression of the foot pedal in position three, the energy is capped at 50%, but does increase up to that point in a linear manner. The other forms of phaco modification are all going to involve a period of off power alternating with a period of phaco on power. And this is beneficial because it actually allows 
uh, a vacuum only to be applied during the period when no power, FACO power, is applied. This allows the emulsate of the nuclear fragments to be removed and allows heat to dissipate when there's no FACO energy being applied. So let's talk about FACO pulse, which is one of these ways where FACO energy can be alternated with on and off periods. So in FACO pulse, as the foot pedal is depressed, the FACO power increases, and you'll see the FACO on and off alternating in the graph down below. Let's talk some more about that. So a few terms to define for FACO pulse. The first is pulse rate. This is how many pulses are delivered uh, per second, or PPS. Secondly, we have what we call the duty cycle, which is the ratio of the ultrasound on time to the total interval of time that you're applying the pedal. So the benefit of FACO pulse is that it actually decreases your overall FACO time, it increases the followability, so pieces are drawn to the tip and stay there better, and there's less energy used, so there's likely some thermal protection that occurs with this power modification. So let's look at the two graphs below. The graph on the left, we can see that the energy is applied and there's an energy off period followed by each of those uh, pulses. As the foot pedal is depressed, the ultrasound energy increases up to the preset maximum. In this case, it's 100%. And the periods of on and off stay alternating as we increase our uh, power applied up to 100%. In the right graph, we have a slower pulse rate. So there's less pulses applied per second. Uh, this would be preset by the surgeon. But we can still see that applying the foot pedal or depressing it into position three all the way down still increases the power applied up to the preset maximum, in this case, 100%. So let's talk now about another form of uh, power modification in FACO, this one called FACO burst. In FACO burst, there's again a period of FACO on followed by a period of FACO off. In this case, there's actually a variable duration of period between the bursts, but the FACO power actually remains set. So the FACO power is set beforehand by the surgeon but it's really the frequency of burst that increases with foot pedal excursion. So essentially, if we think at the extreme of foot pedal depression in this case, we actually approach continuous power um, as the foot pedal is depressed. So essentially, we have linear control of the number of bursts applied per second up to the point where it's continuous, uh, continuously applied ultrasound. So in other words, you can think about it that the rest interval between the bursts progressively decreases as the foot pedal is depressed. But again, in this case, depressing the foot pedal does not increase the power applied power is applied at a preset limit by the surgeon. So let's talk about some other ways that FACO energy can be modified. What we've been talking about so far is so-called longitudinal or traditional FACO, where there's really a forward and back jackhammer style movement, axial movement of the FACO handpiece, or of the FACO needle in the handpiece. But another way to modify this movement is to actually apply it with a torsional or so-called ozzel movement. Uh, which is actually a lateral movement that we can see displayed in the lower right hand picture here. And we can see the picture looking at the handpiece with this lateral movement going back and forth. Now the benefit of this is that there's better followability because the ultrasound handpiece needle is no longer pushing our fragment away when we're trying to actually aspirate it into the handpiece. There's only that lateral movement. So our lumen actually occludes more easily. We have minimal chatter, which is the movement of that piece against the, the nuclear piece against the FACO handpiece. And again, we have improved followability to remove efficiently our nuclear fragments. And these can actually be used in combination together. So you can actually have a traditional jackhammer movement as well as a, an oscillatory or torsional movement combined together to different degrees. So you can get the benefits of both of these uh, when applying FACO. We can also modify the shape of the FACO needle, uh, which can influence the fluidics and the power delivered. Uh, the details of this are beyond this lecture, but we can see in the picture on the right the needle is actually bent and this is the so-called Kelman-style needle, which uh, helps to maximize the torsional uh, movement of the handpiece. And so that's the so-called Kelman needle. So let's talk now about fluidics. And we've defined this previously as the balance of fluid inflow and outflow from the eye. And our goal of fluidics is to maintain a constant intraocular volume with a stable and deep anterior chamber so we can efficiently remove the nucleus in the cataract. So it follows from this that if we remove fluid uh, at an increased rate from the eye, we have to balance it by an increased inflow to maintain this steady state system, which is the goal of fluidics. So looking at our model here, what well, we can see this yellow circle is the representation of the eye, and the phaco handpiece, of course, is inserted into the eye. We can see on the side of the phaco handpiece, there's a white circle that faces us. There'd be another circle on the other side that represents the irrigation port of the phaco handpiece. We can follow this back and see that there's a white box in this other box, and this white box actually represents the pump, which we'll talk about more. And this is the way that the aspiration force is created. 
Now we can see that there's a bottle uh, represented here that has bound salt solution that's going to be flowing into the eye by a gravity-fed system. And it simply is a gravity-fed system, so the higher the bottle height, the more fluid inflow there is into the eye. So if we have a steady state system where there's no fluid being removed, it follows that if we raise that bottle height, that we actually deepen the anterior chamber. So this is a modification we can make uh, if we're trying to work uh, at the time of cataract surgery. So let's talk now about vacuum sources, and there's a few different ways that vacuums can be created. And the goal of vacuum is to create a fluid outflow from the eye. So the more common system to use is a so-called peristaltic, uh, or flow pump, which is pictured on the left side here. And this is driven by a series of rollers which compress the tubing and move fluid through the tubing in such a manner. We can see that the direction of the arrows indicates the direction of fluid flow as the rollers are spinning. So the faster these wheels are spinning, the higher the flow will be through the tubing. On the right side here, we can see a picture of a so-called vacuum pump. In this pump, there's uh, gas is shown by the red arrow that flows through the housing. And as the gas is pumped through the housing, there's a force that's directly transmitted to uh, box D. And box D is the rigid cassette. And we can see that the black arrow on the right side here is the direction that fluid would then be pulled into the cassette from the forces of the gas being pumped through the so-called vacuum pump. And these have different ways of functioning at the time of cataract surgery, so we'll talk about those shortly. So now we have a question. So what modification would you make on the FACO machine to slow down events in the anterior chamber if they are happening too rapidly? A, decrease the aspiration flow rate. B, increase the aspiration flow rate. C, decrease the vacuum level. D, raise the irrigating bottle height. E, lower the irrigating bottle height. Or F, change from a peristaltic pump to a vacuum pump. And the answer is A, decrease the aspiration flow rate. So let's now talk about fluidics outflow. And this is more complicated than fluid inflow to the eye. We have a few different factors that we have to take into account. And let's define a few terms here. So we're first going to define the aspiration rate. And this is actually the flow of fluid in volume, or cubic centimeters per minute, through the aspiration tubing. And we can see in our diagram pictured here as the blue arrows being drawn into the FACO handpiece. And the aspiration flow rate, or just called the flow rate, uh, determines how well particles are actually attracted and how quickly they're attracted to the FACO tip. So if we increase the flow rate, then we actually increase the speed of events that are happening in the anterior chamber of the eye. So events will happen more quickly, fragments will be drawn to the FACO handpiece with more speed. That's what's governed uh, by the flow rate, or aspiration flow rate. We also define what we call the vacuum, or the aspiration level. And this is defined as the magnitude of the negative pressure uh, in millimeters of mercury just inside the tubing of the FACO handpiece. The vacuum actually determines how well, once the tip is occluded, particles actually stay on the tip. So in this case, it's how well do we have for holding power of uh, nuclear fragments on the FACO tip. And in relation to this, we have what we call the rise time, and this relates specifically to flow pumps. And the rise time is the amount of time that's required to reach a given vacuum. And so what happens is vacuum actually has to build uh, up to our preset maximum. So we actually set the maximum, and we have to have this time required for the vacuum to build once the tip is occluded. And the tip has to be completely occluded for the vacuum to build. And that's very important for the FACO surgeon to understand. So these set of pictures will help us to understand how the vacuum actually rises when uh, occlusion is achieved. So we can see in the picture on the right here, the yellow blob represents a FACO, uh, a nuclear piece that's attracted to the FACO tip and fully occludes it. At time 0.2 seconds, our flow rate's 20. Our preset maximum vacuum is 400, but our actual vacuum just inside the handpiece has not yet risen. It's still just about zero. A couple seconds later, with the tip fully occluded still, our vacuum is now rising and it's 200. So we're halfway up to our preset maximum. And if we advance another two seconds, our vacuum has continued to rise because our tip is still completely occluded. And now we're up to our maximum preset vacuum of 100%. And this is what occurs in a flow pump when the vacuum has to rise after tip occlusion. So let's talk now about how these relate to the vacuum sources. So we talked about a peristaltic pump where the rollers actually move fluid through the pump and the speed of the rollers determine the flow rate. So the surgeon actually sets both the flow rate and the maximum vacuum on the machine and the vacuum will rise once occlusion is achieved up to the preset maximum. So the surgeon sets both the flow rate as well as the vacuum. In contrast, a vacuum pump, the surgeon actually only sets the vacuum, and the flow rate is determined by other parameters within the eye. So the vacuum is almost instantaneously achieved once occlusion is achieved on a nuclear piece. 
And so in this case, the flow rate is sort of secondary and can be modified by a variety of other factors in the eye. It's not set by the surgeon directly. So a question, for which pump type does the surgeon have direct control of flow and indirect control of vacuum? And the answer is a peristaltic or flow pump. So now I want to talk about another concept that we call surge. And this can be of great utility to the phaco surgeon to understand, because when it does occur, it can have devastating consequences. So what surge refers to is a temporary shallowing of the anterior chamber when the fluid leaving the eye is greater than the fluid coming into the eye. And so in our picture on the left here, we have a nuclear fragment that's occluded the phaco tip. Our vacuum level has risen to the maximum that we've preset it at. And we can see that the actual tubing is starting to indent because the vacuum is so high and the phaco piece is fully occluding the nuclear fragment. As the phaco energy is applied, the fragment is then emulsified and gets drawn into the phaco handpiece. At that level, the vacuum drops instantaneously. However, the expansion of the tubing and the rapid decrease in vacuum actually causes a surge of fluid to flux into the handpiece. And this can cause a rapid shallowing of the anterior chamber because the inflow of fluid cannot match uh, the quickness with which the fluid was just removed. In this case, we can actually have trampolining of the posterior capsule. It can sort of bounce up. Uh, and th at this point, you can actually uh, cause a posterior capsular tear uh, if you're not careful. Uh, the cornea can actually even collapse if there's a large amount of surge. So the surgeon has to understand this uh, and try to modify factors to prevent it. So let's talk now about ways to reduce or prevent surge. And the easiest of these is actually just to lower your flow rate and your vacuum on your FACO machine. And by doing that, you'll lower your amount of fluid coming uh, through the handpiece and you can actually reduce surge in that way. Manufacturers have also introduced tubing that has reduced compliance because it's actually the compliance of the tubing the compression and the subsequent expansion that leads to the rapid influx of fluid and leads to surge. And so this has also helped to reduce the incidence of surge. And lastly, I want to mention what we call the aspiration bypass stabilizer, the ABS. Uh, you can see it pictured on the right side here of the screen. And on the bottom, you see a small hole that's actually drilled in the shaft of the phaco needle. And what this does is actually allows some fluid to go uh, into the phaco handpiece even when the tip is occluded, as it's supposed to be demonstrated in this picture here. So with some fluid flow, there's actually dampening of surge once the occlusion does break. And we can see on the right side here, the green line represents our maximum preset vacuum. And on the top, we've reached our maximum preset vacuum by the red bar with occlusion of the phaco tip. But on the bottom, we can actually see that because there's some fluid flow, our preset vacuum is never reached by the actual vacuum, which is represented by the red bar here. So you sometimes have to actually account for this and raise your maximum preset vacuum a little bit uh, in these cases when you have the ABS in place. But it should help to reduce the amount of surge uh, and potentially reduce your complications. So in conclusion, uh, the term phacodynamics uh, refers to the uh, physics of closed system phacoemulsification cataract surgery and the efficient removal of the nucleus and cataract lens. And the technology of phacoemulsification has advanced rapidly. And so the savvy phaco surgeon has to really understand phacodynamics in order to uh, to be safe and to maximally remove and efficiently remove the nucleus and the cataract lens. So by understanding these concepts, especially early in your career as a phaco surgeon, you can have increased surgical efficiency and potentially decreased complications. So obviously our goal is safe and efficient remo removal of cataracts through a small incision uh, with minimal disturbance to the eye. Thank you.